The concerts of the whole year, all the performances was condensed to the, this weekend. Uh, every, everything, no? All the performances that we're supposed to do this year. Because yesterday the orchestra met, um, and, you know, since after so many months and we did that project. We got a sponsor to, to do and I was requested that I should finish the project uh, before Christmas. Uh, because after that there, were, there will be no more funds. <laughs> so we had to we, we had to do everything and uh, so at least there are some funds for the orchestra before Christmas and the musicians will get something for Christmas uh, because they haven't really earned so much uh, after all the concerts were were stopped uh, so we we had this uh, uh, so somehow sudden blessing so we had to accept the project and uh, and uh, hope, of course, that of course we had to do our our part in in making sure everybody's safe. Uh, we had some tests done, and of course masks, and we had to put in some panels uh, in between the musicians. Um, so that was uh, well. I'm just actually reporting the recent things no, <laughs> that we've done. Um, nothing much happened in terms of the orchestra, of course. During the lockdown, during the pandemic, most of the musicians shifted into teaching online. And that's what we've done. I've retrained some of the musicians who are, who are not used to doing it for the online teaching. Many of us did, didn't know what to do at the beginning. So we had to learn uh, how to use Zoom, how to, use, uh, how to invest in microphones like this, uh, you know, how to improve things. Uh, so that uh, the students are also engaged now uh, because we never believed. Actually, we were surprised at the effectiveness and interest of people to continue their lessons online. Uh, so we were able to keep our school and this school is now sustaining the, the music school, I mean, uh, of the MSO. It's called the MSO Music Academy, uh, where the, the members of the orchestra teach. So we have shifted everything online. Some of them, some of the teachers went back to their home province. Many of them are not actually from Manila. They're just here for work uh, for as members of Manila Symphony. Uh, but after, um, after the lockdown, some of them went back to their, uh, to their home city. And, but they continue uh, doing their classes, teaching online. So, but they, you know, somehow they missed uh, working in, in real time uh, with the orchestra. So that's what we've been doing uh, in the past weeks, uh, past months, uh, online lessons. And now, of course, this uh, virtual orchestra, we've had some projects, no? recording projects using the virtual uh, style. Uh, um, we've done some virtual concerts. Um, what uh, and I myself uh, get involved in the editing so that's one skill that I had to learn uh, since uh, and in the beginning we could not gather the orchestra physically I had to learn how to do it using uh, editing software for videos and tonight you will see the project we did for this uh, festival um, 58 musicians from all over the world I think I counted like 22 Malaysians and 21 from the Philippines <laughs> and then the rest are from different countries there are 12 countries represented yeah, I was actually um, I didn't expect to be the one to edit this I thought we would just participate uh, but then Mr. Yapling asked me to, to do the video and of course I, I was also excited I was not sure whether um, I was not sure whether it will work, you know, to because we've done a few videos of the full orchestra uh, use, playing pop music, and you know, in pop music, there's usually a steady beat uh, from beginning to end, you know, and the tempo doesn't change, and usually it's four or five minutes, uh, but this one is a movement of New World Symphony, it's 12 minutes long, uh, and it involves so many different instruments and so many you know, changes from the beginning up to the end. So many things happen. And then we've uh, also made it more difficult by dividing the, the video into several parts. So it was, uh, I was surprised at the extent of that. Uh, but I'm excited to show what, what it can do, you know, um, a virtual symphony. Uh, 
um, by by Vorjar. So these uh, these things have been keeping us uh, busy. So I was surprised that we we are still uh, busy in in this last last few months, especially after people have adjusted. Um, but of course, it's still not sure whether the orchestra can you know operate uh, the way it was uh, before um, by by after New Year after next year. There are several, for example, soloists who are beginning to contact me uh, this past month and they are trying to establish concerts for 2021 with us coming from Europe, the Americas, and they want to do a concert with Manila Symphony. And I told them, you know, I'm not sure whether we can, we can still um, do a, we can already do a real season, uh, orchestra season concert next year so that that's not yet uh, sure for us so what we'll do we'll just keep on um, uh, what we're doing now we are on survival mode so so we'll, we'll just try to find ways to continue uh, music making the exciting thing is of course the our work with youth you know, with young people um, we have the Manila Symphony Junior Orchestra uh, many of them have participated. We submitted a video of playing Tchaikovsky uh, Serenade uh, for this festival. I, I don't know if it's, it was shown already because I, wa I wasn't really, I was just working for the past three days. No? I, I didn't watch anything uh, at all. So um, this orchestra is very exciting. Uh, the, the, there are some of the best from the Philippines uh, playing uh, all, uh, the best string players in the Philippines and they just had a uh, competition last week, and all the six finals finalists were from this orchestra. Um, and we also got in touch with a um, with the local government who wanted to start a an orchestra program for public schools. So this is another exciting thing and another uh, opportunity for musicians to make an income by teaching. Okay, um, well, that's that's about a report about Manila Symphony. So yes, thank, thank you. you, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much uh, Jeffrey. Yes. Um, now let's go to Siungan. Siungan is so is a violinist and a pianist, and she's also currently a lecturer of Segi University, and a founder of Heart Foundation. Siungan, tell us more about your Heart Foundation work. Uh, you turn on your mi uh, your uh, microphone. Hi, yeah. can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, Siungan here. Yes, hi. Actually, I am just another children worker that uh, I play music with the children and make them work for other children that need them. That's all. Nothing great, but uh, children from, I deal with children from different walks actually. Some refugees, uh, children from welfare homes, some of the children are very well to do as well, normal children, special children, and we group them together to do good deeds together. And we have a very, very simple orchestra. We name ourselves Heart Symphony because uh, this is a little symphony where um, children from different walks um, helped by professionals and uh, you know, merchant teachers or uh, whosoever who wants to help us, we get together and we just play concerts for charity purposes. So a lot of time, many people have asked me, you know, they, they always ask me, hello, Suhan, um, when you have this kind of children orchestra, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do to these children? You know, everybody is trying to be a star everywhere, you know. Everybody is trying to be in the sports like and so on. But you are telling the children to go to Cambodia and uh, do groundbreaking uh, for, and then go and paint the schools. You know, children travel uh, 250 kilometers away from Bangkok and we just travel there and just to play a concert in a village where there's no stage and so on. So this group of kids, of course, I have to say that our refugee kids cannot go with us, 
but we do have uh, children from welfare home traveling with us to other places to perform together. And um, this is something that keeps me growing, uh, growing and going in music actually. Um, the first time when, when one of the children from a home asked me, teacher, you mean we can play music and use this to help others that need us? I said, yes. They actually, you, you can actually um, hear that there are a little bit of tears, you know, in their eyes. That same goes to my refugee kids. They always thought that they are the one being helped. But the moment when they can turn over, turn their, uh, over and help others, they actually, um, you know, it's like they were speechless. So the meaning of music to all of us is like nothing but just playing a lot of notes together. But of course we do our best to play in tune, to play in time and uh, blah, 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 blah. And uh, it, it was very, very difficult because um, we are dealing with so many different types of children, but they all want and love to play with each other. That's all. So they, they just want to do some things together. So I have at one student, I have also gotten very special children who maybe can only do some plucking or collecno uh, during concerts, but um, no one is trying to outshine anyone. In fact, the more at once kids, uh, students, or you know, professionals, they are just trying to give way and let the other shine. So um, through the years, I actually learned from these children that it's okay that uh, even if we are small, we are not known by anyone uh, in this society. We never advertise or anything like that. We just use our heart to, to share music, our love. And uh, during this pandemic, it's, it's, it's crazy because um, uh, a lot of us have, a lot of my little musician has become cook. Yeah, they cook uh, since, uh, for example, since uh, June to September, every Saturday, my refugees uh, children my students, instead of practicing the violin, the whatever, whatever singing or so, they become cook. They cook spaghetti. Yeah, they start cooking. And uh, and after that, we cook hundreds and hundreds. And in fact, we have cooked thousands of meals already by now and distributed to the uh, to the pools. So so I think this is something nice. And um, and also we we get up um, resources and so on and get foods and I do not know how we got all this uh, PPE stuff and we can give to hospitals and we can give to welfare home masks, uh, including PPE and uh, operation gown and aprons and blah, blah, blah. It was amazing. So there are only, um, I can only say that um, children is so pure that they have this positive energy that actually put help me through this pandemic. As a frontliner, I actually serve uh, as a food relief person. Um, I drive a truck and uh, deliver tons and tons of food to, to these people. And um, the people without food has another type of energy. I don't say that they are negative, but they are just uh, you know, sometimes it's like, it, it, it feels very heavy when you see people without food, babies without um, um, milk powder, moms without money to get the things for themselves, and, you know, you know, ladies without sanitary pads, and so, 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 so much going on. It's so heartbroken to see all this uh, situation and people, but... It is this group of children's energy that keeps me going. 
And I want to thank every single one of them for bulking, for packing. We pack thousands and thousands of uh, food bags and so on and pack vegetables. We are like, Pasar Borong is like, uh, that means the, the, the wet market. You know, we have we converted some homes into wet markets when we receive like 500 kgs of vegetables from from the you know from, from the wet market. They are just the ones or packing like all oh, kangkong one bag this 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 and so on packing rice. It was very fun. Uh, Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Singan. That's a lovely uh, story. Thank you, you and the children. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so from, from your children to um, Dr. Gary, Dr. Gary's, um, I, well, not really children now, isn't it? A lot of um, students that you deal with. Dr. Gary is an associate professor at the School of Health Sciences at um, University of Science Malaysia. He's also the founder of UM, USMKK Symphony Orchestra. Maybe you can talk more about that, Dr. Gary. Um, your, yeah, um, if I were to read your list of awards, <laughs> that will take um, two days of the festival, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe talk about your, your, the work that you do with you. Yeah. I think it's very important uh, during this pandemic that we are connected with each other because uh, through music, we're able to share the love to others, especially during this pandemic. So I've been uh, given some talks uh, how to use music for mental health and how to reduce depression and stress as well. Because as you know that during this time of pandemic, uh, a lot of people's uh, uncertainties about their jobs and stuff. So we use music, try to uh, able to incorporate into that and to reduce by using a better wave music to help them to get more relaxation and also uh, to control the volume as well. When there's music is too loud, people get very headache. So we control into a normal uh, decibels that are able to help others as well. I'd like to share just a quick one whereby uh, the student uh, from USMKK who did uh, some outreach themselves, uh, not together with me that time, I'm actually at uh, Brunel University in the UK, but the student actually took initiative to go out to outreach others. So uh, maybe I can just allow me to share just two videos um, just for a minute. So you can see that, uh, can you see in the video? Yep. Yeah. So, so this is uh, the student actually um, went to the school of the slow learner whereby they introduced drums. And so during the pandemic, uh, they are all separated and they can still also play the drums using the video we share. So they can learn playing drums together outside. So it is uh, from the medical student themselves. So um, it's, I think it's more about they sharing the love to others and we are just there to support. So another one in a hospital, um, this is in Kuching Hospital. So, the MO actually sing to the patient. So this is something that we really uh, cherish that if one doctor able to give back to the community, I think uh, if more doctors actually do it, it will be really interesting. And I think it, the world will change as well. So you can see here, uh, even the matron of the nurse actually come down to praise him as well. I think because of time, uh, we'll share it later. So I, I will say that um, it's more about the student actually took initiative that they will bring the love of music to share to others, especially uh, during this pandemic, whereby if we can able to share a little bit, like playing music together, doing virtual concert together, all of this actually comes together to help others as well. And realize or not, even the small thing we did, it actually have some impact slowly. So from there, our uh, USMKK Symphony Orchestra started the coke, uh, everything, teaching violins lessons all through online. And then they share from the senior, share to the junior as well. So that's all from us from USMKK. Uh, 
in Kota Baru, Kelantan. So I like to thank uh, because it's a change of reaction. So what I learned from Yap Ling, teacher Yap, and then we continue back to, to here as well in Kelantan. And we also expanded into PLPP in Bangi as well, whereby we start up the first uh, disabled orchestra and choir in, in PLPP with, together with Yap Ling. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Gary. Um, yes, we can come back to that. Um, the next doctor that we have, the youngest uh, uh, panelist here is Dr. Channing. Dr. Channing oh. is currently working as a medical doctor at um, Liverpool uh, at St. Paul's Eye Clinic. Is that right, uh, yes. Channing? Yeah, so yeah, pray tell about what you do and uh, yeah, in the outreach field as well. I'll try and be quick, as quick brief as I can. I think I'm probably the smallest fish among the people on this panel, panel today. Um, we all wear many hats, I think. So I, I'm, a, I'm an eye specialist, so I am a, I'm an ophthalmologist, um, a fellow of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, and um, I'm a violinist as well. And I can tell by my violin mark, which has started to fade now since <laughs> it's been so long since I did any proper practice. Um, I think the, in terms of outreach, my main focus has always been on uh, medical outreach in low, in low income countries, which is why I chose to become an eye surgeon. Uh, but also in terms of music, um, part of it is stuff that I try and do on my, on my front. So I've got a quartet here and we try and do perform on the oncology boards. We've done quite a few of the charity shows around here as well for a lot of, the, a lot of patients who are receiving chemotherapy. Um, and it's, it's lovely, maybe it's a, it's a British thing, but uh, all the patients who are, ha are having their, their chemotherapy treatments seem to really like classical music playing in the background. Um, and uh, Tony Shorrocks is on this, on this link and he, he will attest that there's nothing like live music uh, to someone who's in a, in a place of suffering uh, and a place of darkness. Um, I think it, I mean, in terms of my other outreach work, uh, I, I think I'm far behind most of my, my fellow colleagues here, but, uh, uh, but I, uh, little work that I have done is, has been in low, in low income countries and in the UK. Um, you'd be surprised as, as, as the dearth of, uh, of classical music training here in, in, in England uh, as, the, as there's more and more cutbacks in terms of public funding for music. Um, but I'm going to draw it short there and just say that I'm very happy to be here uh, to be sharing my experiences. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Channing. Um, yes, the fifth uh, panelist here is um, Adolfo, uh, who is a performer and a luthier. A guitar maker, and he has a foundation in Indonesia, which is called the Art for a Better World. Art for a Better World. Do you want to elaborate on that, Adolfo? Hello, guys. Do I have enough minutes to talk about me? It will take one hour. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, um, it's very difficult in remote areas to uh, teach them without a musical instrument. <clears throat> so I went to this place and uh, I see them, they, they don't really have anything. So, uh, okay, we can't afford buying an instrument. So let's make our own instrument. So what I did was prepare the kit. We started with the ukulele because we have children, small ones, very small ones. Okay, they don't know what it is. They have no idea. <laughs> so, okay guys, we are gonna make a ukulele. All right, so I set them up, tables, and I brought the kit, everything ready for assembly. So when they were making the ukulele, I can see them being something like, oh, this thing is okay. So we, we finished, uh, I think we did some 30 or 40 ukulele. And after that, they were all very happy strumming the ukulele. It can produce a sound. <laughs> and of course, they are, it, it was their first time to be able to play or be able to make a musical instrument. Okay. <laughs> I gather them all together with the ukulele that they made and I teach them a song. And it was their first time to play a ukulele and sing the yellow submarine. <laughs> 
that's how it started. And we have uh, in, in this uh, foundation or academy uh, art for better world. They are very small children. Uh, we were teaching something like 40 very small children. And when I was teaching them, of course, the parents were on the back looking how the, 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 the children will do it. And I was quite touched because absolutely I know they have nothing. I don't expect anything in return. But the following days, the parents were bringing me uh, bananas and potatoes and everything uh, the way they could repay me, you know. So for me, that was very touching. Uh, that was very, uh, yeah, something that, you know, from these people giving me those things. All right. So I told them that now you can play the ukulele. <laughs> Let's do a performance. Let's play. Uh, Let's go to the, universe, to the schools first, to the elementary school around the village. And then uh, we did a performance. I made them become a performer. So after they perform, so they were really like encouraged to do more. Okay, we do some more. The following year, we went to another school and to another school and to another school. Now, I think they're half musicians. Huh? They become musicians in the end. <laughs> uh, and, and we finally, we brought them to Taiwan for the music festival in Taiwan. And they performed for the Gilan International Music Festival. I think that was something that they were kind of dream of coming out of their village and going to another country in an airplane. I don't think they have been in an airplane before, I doubt. So it was something like a thing that for them, impossible, but through music, being able to do something with the instrument can bring them to other places. I'm not a good teacher, definitely I'm not. But in a way, I think we can, as a, as a teacher, we can inspire young people to get into something we did all our lives. And that's for me is more rewarding because I had a lot of students, but not everybody become musicians, you know? But when I teach these people, these children, I teach them one song. Oh, they've been doing the song Cool Week. They practice, uh, which rich people won't do, because I teach in Spain also. I teach a very rich uh, in a very rich school. I teach them one song in one hour. The next lesson, they don't even remember anything, because it's so easy for them. But in this place where I teach in Indonesia, I teach one song and they sing every day until the next lesson. They know they know everything already. You know, so it's a different level of uh, teaching, I suppose. So, well, I can keep on talking on and on. <laughs> Adolfo, um, how would stop. you, Adolfo, um, how would you measure the success of your outreach program? Um, yes. Can you share with us how you, how you um how you how you check on how you know effective well, the program uh, is? Well, I really don't check them. Of course I don't, you know, I'm just sharing what I can share, but I always think about something that will hook them to music. I look at them from their point of view, how they look at music. Oh, oh I, they would tell me, oh, I like the music of uh, this guy and oh, the music of that guy and all that. So I try to listen to them and see if I can connect 
through their level of thinking and come up with some music, maybe not exactly the same, but similar to what they are expecting in the first level. Mm. Now, and what about, yeah. Yes, continue. Uh, sorry, carry on. Are you? All right. Yeah. Because most of them only uh, are able to uh, see them perhaps on the on the YouTube or I don't know. So what I did was I invited musicians from Japan, and because they were talking about different cultural music of different countries, so I said no problem. I have many friends around the world anyway. So I just call my friend and say, hey, you want to come and help me here in Indonesia? Because uh, this, these young children want to see you live, not just through YouTube. So they came. So I invited the uh, yeah, a musician from Japan and from the Philippines, of course, and uh, from, uh, from the local Indonesians and from Taiwan. Uh, you know, so they could experience variety performers from different uh, culture, background, and tradition. And, you know, uh, we, we, we taught them the, the song of Japan, we taught them the song of the Philippines, and, you know, they were all dancing. So I can ask, perhaps um, with, with that, I can also ask um, the other uh, panelists, maybe around this time, what is what are the challenges that you face in your trying to do your outreach programs? Uh, maybe Jeffrey? your academy how difficult it is um for you at this time and what are the measures that you're taking you know in order to overcome jeffrey you, you have to unmute yourself okay can you hear yes me? okay okay yes uh our academy, of course, is online now. We, we used to, we had studios all over the city. We had three. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, the one of them, we had to close because of, we, we keep on paying rent and then we are not using it. So we agreed to close one, one academy. And uh, well, if in case we will need another one, we, we've converted my office into a studio. Um, ah. We it into a studio, like a makeshift mm -hmm. studio. Mm -hmm. And so there are like three pianos in my office now. And <laughs> have to, yeah, th these are the way we adjust, you know, we'll, we'll just adjust this way. Um, I think uh, music will, will continue here. I mean, people are still interested there. Um, in terms of interest with of people, it's there. Uh, but I think the 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 hope for for us is to really spread the art of music uh, through teaching more no? um, mm -hmm. concerts uh, maybe one one or two big ones are okay live concerts might still be ha happening in the future but really now what we're strengthening is um, uh, this uh, interest for everyone to play music huh? To play music, not just to listen and uh, clap, no, <laughs> to the clap at good musicians, but play mm -hmm. it themselves. Okay, so that's what we are thrusting on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeffrey. What about uh, Dr. Gary? Um, what are the measures that you're taking during this time to continue to sustain your outreach program? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, basically, we we have to conduct most of our uh, teaching lesson online now. So we have to juggle between playing versus listening. So many people talk about listening music for therapy, but it is very different by playing it yourself. So when you are playing in a group, it increases your self-efficacy, it increases your self-confidence, and it will be able to relate with others as well. The satisfaction of playing together is very different. So that's why we do some online playing together. So, uh, however, we always struggle whereby we work with the uh, populations whereby they do not have internet access. So that actually a big challenge whereby uh, they still need to go to school. But uh, with all the SOPs and stuff, um, they could not go to school at all. So that's why uh, sometimes we still need uh, the medical 
uh, doctors, especially the student, when they are going there to give uh, medicine and to provide uh, visitations, uh, use that opportunity just to play some music together with the kids. So I think it's a, a good opportunity for them to express themselves as well. So in order for us to measure impact, it's really hard, but uh, we always say that um, the impact will come further. So when one person be taught of uh, playing the instruments for the family, uh, in fact, this is one of the oldest music therapy whereby uh, people came back from the war, uh, people get uh, PTSD, and the musicians were bring in as the first music therapies um, to play music for the war uh, people. So they are doing that through their medical uh, student experience. So I think it's a, a small things, but uh, the impact will slowly be expanded when they go out to serve the community. So I mm. think the chain of reaction. Yes, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Dr. Gary. Um, Siunan, so well, how, do you, how do you plan to uh, keep going in these difficult times? Uh, what's your advice to... Um, the people who want to help or who want to do more outreach, what would be the best way? Um, I think um, in a lot of homes and so on, nowadays, uh, because of the pandemics, we, we, we need a lot of uh, good internet access, we need a lot of equipment and so on. Um, in order to help these children learn better, even in um, music lessons and so on, they need good equipment. So if if someone has, a, if you have an extra laptop that you can share, you can give away, please give it to the home. If you, um, and also, I just want to share an experience, um, uh, what, what we have uh, gotten through. Uh, give me one minute. Um, it's like uh, we actually set up an examination board uh, for uh, JPO's outreach students and as well as my own kids. Yeah. So what happened was um, I, um, when the children were trying to send in, yeah, 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 entries, exam entries, and so on. It's online exam because we cannot afford a face to face examination right now. So, um, Jiri Hong actually took like almost half a day in order to load the videos uh, and send it to us. The best part is Quota Marudu kids actually took three days for 22 candidates. So, internet, uh, internet speed was extremely slow in all these areas. And that makes things very, very hard for, for us to teach online or, you know, I think uh, Jessica and Yapling, even Hainok uh, are facing, I mean, are trying to solve this problem, but this is um, everybody's problem, especially when we are dealing with children in remote areas. So um, they need equipment and uh, hopefully all this situation can be better soon. Yeah, that's all. Thank that you. I Yes, thank you, uh, Xing An. Um, Dr. Chenning, um, what would your advice be for a young musician or somebody who's just starting, but who wants to connect to uh, the community, who wants to do more outreach? What would your advice be for them? I think from my perspective, uh, this is very culturally dependent, uh, relevant to whichever part of the world you're in um, and what infrastructure is already available there. Um, I think the first thing you have to go overcome is really fear about the unknown and fear of, of, of going and do it just and just doing it. Um, it's much easier, of course, to do it with organizations, but um, a, in some ways, organizations themselves can be quite unwieldy when you want to reach out to, uh, to local communities. Um, I think there's a few things that I was thinking just actually when, when Dr. Kwan and, and, and Sionan were speaking about outreach and, um, and how we can view outreach going forward. Um, there are... Uh, there are personal steps that we can take and institutional steps that we can take. Outreach can will always be a problem. Um, one thing that we've, we, I've learned from, um, from doing sort of uh, medical outreach uh, as an ophthalmologist and as an eye surgeon is to uh, use the equipment I have here in the UK very wisely. We have a lot of access to uh, a lot of um, surgical equipment here and, and, and technology that we wouldn't necessarily have in the, in the, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so we've taken steps to try and reduce our waste of equipment and use uh, leftover equipment uh, in, in low income countries. And we've sent uh, some sets of equipment to Malawi. Um, and I think that that's one thing that we can uh, employ in, in terms of musical outreach as well. Um, Dr. Kwan mentioned about measuring impact. This is a big one for me, uh, a 
a big problem. I'm, I, I'm actually, I actually work with the London School of Hygiene. I'm, I'm currently working on trying to get a review published on, uh, on universal health coverage and how we measure universal health coverage. The World Health Organization uses a set of 16 tracer indicators to sell, say how good is a healthcare program in a country. And they use things like uh, childbirth mortality, uh, like uh, pregnancy rates, li uh, literacy rates, uh, education rates, among other things. Um, and I, it's, always, it's been stuck in my mind, how do we measure the impact of a musical outreach program um, so JPO, for example, produces teachers. So that's one way to do it. How many people are educating music in the local communities? Um, you, can use, uh, you can use some measure of proxy uh, musical literacy, for example. Um, just, there's, just, there's just so many things you could still do in terms of improving the, uh, the, the way that you conduct outreach and, and reach out to communities. I know this is not exactly what you asked. Uh, <laughs> from a personal side about how to get involved with outreach programs, I think really it, there, there are always people, uh, champions of outreach in each community you're in, um, uh, no matter which society you're in. And those people that I would really approach, find them uh, and, um, and get involved. There's, no, there's nothing like personal experience in terms of, 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 uh, of getting out there and, 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 and reaching out to people around you who need help. Yes. Shut up now. Thank you. Thank you. Adolfo, what's your last words on encouraging uh, young people, perhaps? What should they do uh, in order for them to do more community work? And well, you've got two minutes, by the way. <laughs> well, it's like hello and goodbye, huh? Okay, I'll do it very short. Um, yeah, one of the reasons why I become a, became a guitar player and a guitar maker especially a guitar maker, was because uh, uh, I couldn't afford buying a, a concert guitar. That's very expensive. I cannot afford it. You know, when I was young, I cannot buy anything, in fact. So I had to learn how to make it. And that was a motivation for me now that young, these young people can be taught and maybe in the future they can become like me also, or even better than me. I hope they will be better than me to become, uh, yeah, what they really want to become in, in their life. You know, mm -hmm. mine is like, I want to do something that's worth living for. I want to do something that I really want to do, not just making money or doing things to keep myself. No. My my purpose is uh, to live my life the way I want it to be lived. My motive is don't just dream, uh, live your dreams. That's what I can say. And those are things I do for my for my foundation. Yeah, you have to live your dreams. Don't just dream. Uh, live your dreams. Okay. I think, that's it. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way to to sort of end um, this session. Basically, um, I I remember reading uh, because you were saying Adolfo about have, living a life that's worthwhile, and I remember in that um, what I read was this person said, um, "Whatever you do in life, always think of think of the three wins. The first win is for, obviously for yourself." You do something that will benefit yourself. That's usually our main motivator. But the second win must be about benefiting someone else. Um, whatever it you do must also on. benefit somebody, some, someone else. So that's the second win. And the third win uh, is uh, to help to make the world a better place. And I believe that all, all, all of you, I thank you all for um, what you do, because basically what, you, what you're doing, your humanitarian spirit is um, making everyone's life uh, better, uh, better for them and this world a better place. Um, but before we end, um, I think I just want to check with what, um, what we have. The last question here is how do you manage sustainability outreach, outreach program especially when there is no support from government, sponsors or patron. Dr. Gary, can you, can you answer that? Uh, okay, I will try. Uh, basically, our orchestra do not have funding at all, but uh, every time we do 
sponsor, uh, people actually come in to sponsor. So I think uh, it's very important just to continue with whatever resource you have and try to support others as well. So I'm sure it's a change of reaction. So for example, every time we do uh, concerts, uh, Yapling actually bring a group of people come to support us. And Penang uh, also, uh, Gan also bring a group of people to support us. So we support each other as a change of reaction. So I think it's more important as a group of musicians, we always uh, remember that we need to help others and others also help us when we need it. Okay. Oh, good answer. Um, uh, Jeffrey, are you still there? I can't see you. Is Jeffrey still there? Yeah, Jeffrey. So, what's you, what about you? What's your answer to that? If you're not, if you don't get help from the government, what do you do? You have an academy. Yes, uh, yes, actually, that's what we've been doing. We've never really received anything. Uh, we've been surviving all these years uh, without government support. Um, so it's really figuring out um, how to be self-sustaining. Uh, and I, I found that. Uh, Six years ago, when we did this uh, school, when we added the M MSO Music Academy into the project of the foundation, uh, we had become more stable. Because before that, the orchestra was dependent on just a few sponsors. And sometimes, you know, one sponsor can just decide, next year, no more. Huh? And there, then that's the end. You know? You know, but now with the model of having a school, and then when we also did the youth orchestra project, the youth orchestra actually attracts much more uh, support than the professional orchestra in terms of donation. Somehow people like to support um, the future. They like supporting young people. So they are pouring, it's easier to ask for support for, uh, for the development of young people rather than to support music or classical music in general yeah. and I understand what they're paying for sometimes or what they're, what they're supporting with just music but when you say you know this is the development of young people it's talent it's easier and uh, and uh, so that's my experience uh, for these past years that we've been in the Hmm. Thank you, Jeffrey. What about Siungan? Last word from you. How do you think? Because you have been doing that, haven't you? You've been doing a lot. Yeah. Concert. One of the easiest way is to recycle instruments. It's like we have a lot of rich people, people that are well to do. You know, when 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 their children are grown, uh, the size let's say a quarter size or half size, like just to give them to you. Ask them. Take it, take it back and then get a luthier to actually repair and redo all these things so that this can be put uh, into use, in good use for all these outreach students. So you save money uh, um, and time yeah, for that. That's all. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So basically, I think uh, we all agree that um, I think you, you, you probably, I think it's a case of if you do something for someone else, it involved a lot of people, as uh, Jeffrey also was saying, it involves youth. It, it, it implies hope for the future. I think uh, you don't need to go out there to solicit fun because people will see what you're doing. Um, and even, and, and as Dr. Gary also says, it all it always starts small, you know, little by little. Uh, and, and I truly believe that if you're doing something that's worthwhile, and you're not doing it just for yourself, uh, for your own um, yeah, self-gratification. If people can see that, you don't need to do much more and you will get the support. Well, thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, all of you are busy. And I wish you all well. Um, and may you continue to inspire, uh, particularly uh, those who want to start working with community. I hope that people who, who watch this video will be able to also share with their friends that there's more to music than just music itself. It can heal, heal uh, people's heart, like what Dr. Gary is doing. It can also help uh, those who don't see much hope. Adolfo shared that in his um, talk about not having much, but he continues to open lots of schools, right? In like, Taiwan, Indonesia. 
Spain. Jungan for driving your van. Good on you, Jungan. Um, Dr. Channing, yeah, young, so you've got more, more to give. Uh, and I hope that in your doctoral work, you'll be able to also help people uh, health wise and make them uh, love music. Um, thank you, all of you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Dr. Channing, Adolfo, Xingan, uh, Gary, and all the technical team. Um, and God, God bless you all. <laughs>